as long as no one has any more questions, and I'll stop if you do, what I wanted to talk about today is how to document a process in Touchstone. So not just the how to do it, but um, not just technically how to do it, but how to how to decide what tools you want to use for that process and then how to use those tools effectively. So oh, when you click a process, if you look over to the left here, you're going to see all the templates here that you have available to document with. So the very first one at the top here is called a work plan. And a work plan is just simply a step-by-step -step set of tasks. So they're generally actions or steps that someone would take in order to accomplish the result of the process. So this process is called customer complaints. So there's a title here called customer complaint processing, and there's a work plan. And this work plan is just a series of steps or tasks. Below the work plan tasks is this section here called expectations. So tasks are generally actions. Steps. And then the expectations field is for um, qualities or some uh, qu uh, qualitative things, um, timing, when something's done, anything subjective. So if there's anything more that you want to say about what's happening in this work plan that's not a part of the task, then this is a good section for it down here. So that's work plans. The second tool down is called a checklist. And I can take a work plan like this one, and using this toolbar item right here, I can click OK. And then that will turn that work plan into a checklist. So if we're looking right here, you can see all the different tasks of that work plan are now next to these check boxes. So the checklist tool is for quality control. Um, it's when you need evidence that steps have been done. <clears throat> that the the um, tasks of this process have been completed. <clears throat> Next tool down here is called a script. So a script is used for um, documenting a conversation, frequently asked questions, anything that happens verbally. So when um, when you get to a task of a process and somebody is uh, going to make a phone call, they're going to explain something verbally, then that's a good sign that, that, the, that you would use the scripting template in that process. <clears throat> Next tool down here is called Uploaded Files. And there's not an uploaded file here in this process. That's why you're not seeing any titles underneath here. The Uploaded Files tool is for uploading documents, spreadsheets, PDF manuals, um, anything in PowerPoint. So when you have a um, information like that that needs to be used in this process, then you can take that document or spreadsheet or PowerPoint or PDF and upload it to the process. So you just give the file a name and then you hit choose file and then you would upload that entire document. When you upload a file, it's keeping it in its original software format. So if it's a document, then it's going to be a Word document. This next tool down here is called the Document Tool. And the Document Tool is um, for, it's like a blank Word document. So you can build a form like this one here. Um, if this form wasn't here, I'll just move this down so you can see what I mean by that. You could then just use this as a text field, you just type in your text right here. It, it has all the different character and functionality normally that Word does. So the document tool um, is the most customizable of all the tools. Um, you can build a form in it like this one. You can put in, write a letter. You can put in sample emails. You can put in text. You can insert big images using the image uploader. So anything that you need in the process and the other tools don't fit for whatever reason, then the document tool is a good, um, a good bet for that. Underneath the document tool, there's the custom form tool. 
<clears throat> so the custom form tool allows you to build forms, fillable forms. So it's got a short answer field, a paragraph field. This is an example of a paragraph. So you'd start in with a question or a statement, and then someone uses this field to then fill in that information. Or you make, um, these are check boxes. So what are some examples of things not to do? And then you can, these boxes can be checked off. This is multiple choice right here. So you can use these fields like multiple choice, checklist, and drop down to create these fillable forms. Now where we are now is where the form is created. Where it's used is over here on the dashboard. So before we end, I'll show you what this form looks like on the dashboard. Same for checklists like this one. This is where they're created, where we are now, but they're used over here. So if you try to ch check this box off, then it's going to open it for you to edit it edit the text, because this isn't where things are, are used. They're used on the dashboard. Um, underneath the custom form tool here, there's a policy tool. So this is a template for you to document the policy. So anything that's legal or compliance or safety related or some kind of important knowledge the person needs to have or, or a rule they need to follow, you can document it in this formal policy template right here. What this does is it just kind of brings a little bit more importance to it for the employee. So if they see it in this template, then they'll go, okay, well, that's an important policy and they're likely to remember it more. We put policies inside of processes that they're related to. So someone's asking this question right now, so I'll just say a little bit more about that. Um, they're asking, what's the difference between this and a policy manual? So a policy manual could be like an employee handbook, or I've seen manuals that businesses have created that are just pages and pages of policy. There are some industries that are more um, policy driven and they have a lot of rules and compliance things than others. Um, I know law firms do have, like all of you, do have um, policy that that is important to, you know, around confidentiality and things like that. I don't think it's super um, heavily um, audited and a lot of compliance compared to other industries. So if you do have policy manuals like I'm describing, there's nothing wrong with having those in a manual. In fact, you could make a process title and call it um, compliance manual or employee handbook and then upload that document and then make it a public process and people can, employees can go here to the dashboard and access it. Having said that, there is some value in having a policy that's related to a process inside of that process. So this is the customer complaint process. And the warranty and guarantee policy is, it's important for an employee to know what that is because they're assessing inside this process whether something is um, a guarantee or a warranty item. So that's why this policy is here. It brings some uh, relevance to it. So if I'm just reading through an entire manual with 10,000 policies in it, I'm li unlikely to remember every single policy. But when the policy is in the process and I'm learning the process and the steps of the process, I see why this is important related to those steps. So that's why we have um, policies related to processes inside of that particular process. Then lastly here, we have a video and audio upload tools. So this is um, an audio, a, a video that's just been uploaded to Touchstone. And then there are audio files down here that have been uploaded. So you can shoot a video <clears throat> using um, your computer um, and software you have on your computer. Um, the Jing tool that most of you have seen me use before um, has a uh, screen recording feature. Um, there are a lot of free screen recording features. I just heard the other day that Chrome has an add-on that you can buy um, in the Chrome um, app store that will do screen captures. So if you have voice over internet, you can you have a headset that you're using, you can record your screen captures and your voice 
and then upload that video to Touchstone right here in the video tool. So if the process lends itself to a video, like it, it, you could visually represent what you're trying to explain, then shooting a video is a really good idea. You can even take the work plan and use it like a step-by-step -step of what you want to show in the video um, and then upload that video. You can take your phone and shoot videos of somebody talking or somebody doing something and then upload that whole video. I saw a video in Touchstone a couple days ago where one of the PILMA members had uh, recorded um, one of the managing partners talking, like an introduction to the company. These are, this is our vision, this is our culture, this is what we believe in, this is the kind of employees we have. And it was really, it was part of their, they made it part of their onboarding process, and I thought that was a pretty clever thing to do. Um, I also saw, this was a few months ago, um, inside of a PILMA member's intake process, their client intake, client intake they had um, someone talking about the importance of intake, like, um, and I can't remember who it was, but they had a call center and they, the manager maybe was talking about, you know, wow, this is like the lifeblood of the firm, like when the leads come in, how important it is. And I think that added something to the intake process for, for new employees who are learning it. So get creative with your videos like that. They don't need to be big Hollywood productions. In fact, don't make them that way. Don't stress about them. Just shoot a video. Um, and then upload it. It can uh, things change. It could be made better. Things get replaced. So don't get hung up on it having to be perfect. Just shoot a video. And then audio down here is the same idea, except for these are MP3 files. So you can record how something's supposed to sound. So this is you if it process has scripts in it like these. It's a good idea to re do a role play of those scripts. You can put actual. Like in an intake process, you can put actual um, conversations that the intake people are having with leads. You can record those. It's super easy to record nowadays. We don't have to have tape recorders. You can just use your cell phone to record. Um, I think this is a clever idea, an example of what not to do, like how it's not supposed to sound. <laughs> if someone can hear how why saying something in a certain way is important and why not to say it in another way. If they can hear that, like a real-life example of that, then it makes an impact. So those are all the tools. Um, when choosing which tools to use, the first thing I would say is most of the time, 99% of the time, the process should have a work plan. So the work plan is always a good place to start. A process may have a checklist or a script or a file or a form, and it may not. It just depends on what the needs of the process are. But 99% of the time, it, processes will always have a work plan. That's because the work plan is the overall tool that allows you to document the details of the process. So it's the primary tool for that. If a process doesn't have a work plan, in my opinion, it's not fully documented. It has to have a work plan. A video like this one does not replace a work plan, unfortunately. The reason is, if I'm looking at this work plan, I can see tasks one through six. If I forget what I need to do after I determine whether it's a warranty issue or not, and I know I, I now have to go to enter leads into the CRM if I forgot what's in between, if all there is is a video, then I have to rewind the video, re move it back to that space, find where that is, first of all, and then listen while someone tells me. And then probably what I'm doing is making notes about what they're saying. So it's much better if those notes are already in a work plan. So the video enhances the training. It makes it more interesting. It shows me real examples. It shows me pictures and, act and movements. But I can't remember everything that's in a 20-minute video. Um, so that's why, you know, the work plan is important, and then you can add the video. It's not the other way around. Um, so start with a work plan. This is a second type of work plan, and I put this in here just to show the difference. This is called customer complaint guidelines. So this is just a series of things that somebody needs to be thinking about while they're doing customer complaints. It's like strategies or approaches or techniques. 
So you can make a work plan like this if you've got these techniques for handling customer complaints. You could, I could have put these six things into a form, right, into a document right here if I wanted to. I could have just cut and pasted them or I could make them into a work plan. So sometimes there are like just things people need to know that are important and they're not really tasks. They're not really step by step. So you can put them into a second work plan like this one if you choose. Decide if you need a checklist by just asking yourself, does this need some quality control? Would it be useful for a manager or for the employee themselves to be able to track what they've done and not done? So think about that. If it is useful, then build a checklist. You can take a work plan and turn it into a checklist like we did here, or you can just build a checklist. So all of the tools work the same way. If I want to build a checklist, I just click the title here, and then I'm prompted for the name of my checklist. So I put in the name of the checklist, and then I just hit Create Checklist. So now you can see over here, there's a second checklist that's been created. So all the tools work the same way. Click the title, put the name in, hit Create. So if there's a need for quality control, if there's um, a need for if the process or the actions they're taking are so complicated that it's useful for the employee to be able to remember what they've done and haven't done, that's another need for a checklist. If the manager or the company itself needs evidence that these things have been done for quality control, that's another reason for a checklist. Scripting, we kind of talked about already. Decide if you, the process needs a script based on the fact of whether or not it has a conversation in it. Is there a verbal interaction at all? If there's not, you don't need a script. You just leave this blank. If there is, then you can build the script. And then an, a good technique is to go back to the work plan here and hyperlink the task to the script. So this right here is a, called a, is a hyperlink to this script right here. If the, if the process has documents that need to be used in it, like a file or a form or a spreadsheet that needs to be filled out, then upload those documents. If you have spreadsheets and Word documents and forms and things like that in um, Google Docs, you can make hyperlinks to those documents if you want to keep them in Google Docs. So that would re replace the need for having an uploaded file. Um, in a work plan, you'd just say, access this spreadsheet here. Um, and then someone clicks that, and then they would go to Google Docs and see that spreadsheet. But if you don't have things in Google Docs, and you just have them on files and folders all over your network, then um, upload them to the appropriate process using the uploaded files tool. Um, use the document tool if there's any content that doesn't fit into the other tools. You can cut and paste it into the document tool. Use the custom form tool when you um, need information about what happened in the process. So this is a customer complaint form right here. So in this example, we need information about what's happening when a customer is complaining, what, uh, what happened in that process. Did the employee call them? Did their complaint get resolved? What was the complaint about? Um, what was the result of the investigation? What was action that was taken? So all this is critical information for a manager or anyone who's making sure complaints are resolved um, to, to um, collect. So that's the use of the custom form. You can also use the custom form to create tests for the process. So this is an example of a test. So if you, if someone is learning how to handle customer complaints and they're going through this process, after they've learned it, they can take a test and you can build that test right inside of the custom form. So then the employee would go to the dashboard and they would um, take the test, they complete the form. If there's a 
policy that's really important related to the process, then use the policy note. If there's not, leave this blank. If you can, if you can do a video with your phone or a screen capture video, then use the video tool. If there's a script in a process, because there's a verbal interaction, then do an audio file of that script, do a role play of it, and then upload that. So let's go back up here. So let's talk about what makes a good work plan. So a work plan should have enough detail in it that somebody who doesn't know how to do this could read it and know what to do. So that's, I think it's clear yet ambiguous at the same time because the question is always, well, what's enough detail and what's not enough detail? I'd say across the board, when I look at a work plan, generally there's not enough detail in it. That would be usually one of my first critiques of it, not enough detail. So here's a way to decide or figure out if you have enough detail. Think about the minimum competency level of the employee. So think about the qualifications, the schooling, the experience that employee would need to have before you would hire them into the position that's going to be doing this work that you're documenting. So in this example, someone who's handling customer complaints, what's the minimum competency level for that position? You can even make a process and touchstone. Um, I would put it in the running the business section and human resources, and it could it could be um, qualifications and experience for um, an intake person or a paralegal or a lawyer. And then you'd list out what the experience and the qualifications are and the education level for that position. Then from that point of view, you document the work plan. Work plan. So here's a really clear example for law firms. If you're hiring in associates or lawyers, they have to have law degrees, right? They have to have passed the bar. They have to, for entry-level um, law positions or lawyer positions, maybe they don't need to have a whole lot of experience because um, you're hiring them at entry level, but they have to have a law degree, and I'm assuming they'd have to pass the bar exam at some point. So you can assume that they know the basics of how to be a lawyer, so you don't need to build processes for how they do that. They learn that in school. Um, another example, if you're hiring someone in to be your bookkeeper and the minimum qualifications are that they need to know QuickBooks, they need to um, have a bookkeeping certificate, they have to be a certified bookkeeper, which means that maybe they needed an associate's degree or they have to have a, um, a certificate in some kind of program that taught them how to do that. Plus, you want them to have five years of bookkeeping experience. So if we hire a person in like that, then we don't need to teach them how to use QuickBooks or we don't need to teach them what, um, how to run an accounts payable report or what accounts payable is. They know that. The opposite of that is if you're going to hire in a bookkeeper and you don't want to pay for someone who's had five years of experience because you feel like your bookkeeping procedures are pretty good, then your bookkeeping procedures need to go to that level of detail. You need to explain how they open QuickBooks, how they get to the general journal section, how do they run a report. So all of that needs to be explained. So think about, from this perspective, think about what's enough detail and what's not enough based on the minimum qualifications of that person. Usually a work plan will start at the beginning. <clears throat> so when you begin, when you start your work plan, think about what's the first thing that happens when somebody is handling a customer complaint. So usually what I would do is think about, and I'm just going to add a task here to show you. I would think about where where does the where does the process start? How do you know that someone has complained? So when a customer complaint comes in, how do I know? Is it by the phone? Um, do they email? Do they call the person they were working with? How do you know where it starts? And this usually like sets the stage for the beginning of the process. Where does it start? You can even start the work plan by saying um, customer complaints come in through telephone or email. 
then go to the next step. When somebody receives the customer complaint, what do they do first? So here we're saying they locate the customer's invoice. If they can't let the, locate the invoice, they ask the customer if they have an invo invoice number. or So this is an interesting task right here, right? When I'm reading it, it's a little hard to follow, isn't it? Locate the customer's invoice. If you can't locate the invoice, ask the customer if they have an invoice number or a copy of their invoice. Gather the following information. The reason this is hard to uh, understand while I'm saying it and also why I'm looking at it is because it's written like a paragraph. It's written like a story. It's like sentence after sentence all together explaining a lot of things that somebody does in task two. So I did this on purpose to make the point that it's better if you break things up into steps. If you have the tendency in your writing to write like a story, explaining something with a lot of detail and a lot of um, flowery language and a lot of verbs and adjectives, stop yourself from doing that when you're writing document when you're documenting a process. Try to think in short, specific steps. So here's a technique that will help you. Break things up. So this says locate the customer's invoice. If you can't find the invoice, so this is an if then, if you can't find the invoice, ask the customer if they have a copy of their invoice. Then probably what I would do is take the rest of this out. I'm just cutting it out. And now I'm going to save this. So that's pretty clear right here. Locate the customer's invoice if you can't ask the customer. Okay. Then I'd probably make another task out of this other information. So gather the following information. That's going to be a list. So I'd probably do it like this and then make it bullet points. So after every comma, make it a bullet point. Like that. This is what product or service was performed and any other details as necessary to help you address the situation. With this, I can probably even do like a sub-bullet. And if you do an indent, now this is a sub-bullet of that. And now I'm going to save this. I'm going to drag this up here just so you can see the difference now. So that one task that was a paragraph of information has now been broken up into this. So it's easier to see it this way. Now I'm going to locate the customer's invoice. If I can't find their invoice, I'm going to ask them if they have the number. Then I'm going to gather the following information. Now I have a list of things I'm going to gather. The client's name and their phone number, location of the job performed, what service was performed, and any other details as necessary. So use this kind of technique when you're creating your tasks. Think step by step. Make lists rather than sentences. Use bullets and sub-bullets to help break things up. Make it so your a person's eye can follow what it is that they're doing. Think about performing that action while you're reading it. So it's much easier for me to perform that action while I'm reading this if it's not in paragraphs of information, but it's more in list format. In your work plans, use if-thens if you need to. So. A lot of times work that we do can take one direction or another based on what happened in the last task. So in that situation, use if then. So if warranty issue, proceed to the customer complaint form. If this is if this is not a warranty issue, then follow the warranty and guarantee policy. If this if cannot be resolved, complete the customer um, form and inform the manager that a complaint has been received. So think one direction or another and use if-thens. Remember to hyperlink things. So this is, if, the war if this is not a warranty issue, proceed to complete the customer complaint form. So this is this form down here. If you're writing out a task and you're saying complete the form or use the script, Put in a placeholder for that form. You don't have to do the form right away or the script right away, but put in a placeholder for it inside the process and then make a link to it. So I'm highlighting this, and then I go here to the hyperlink tool, 
and I hit the link drop down and I'm looking for a form, a custom form. And then I hit the drop down here and I'm seeing all of my custom forms in alphabetical order. There's that customer complaint form and I hit insert and now this is a link to that form. So make these hyperlinks. It just makes it easier when someone's learning because they see the form here and then they know in this task is where they use it. So here's another example of that. This is, if this is not a warranty issue and it is an employee issue or simply a job that wasn't done well, try to resolve it using the providing a solution script. And this is a link right to that script. Here's another example of effective use of hyperlinks. So at the end of this work plan, I'm saying enter flags and actions into the CRM. So CRM is a customer relationship management software. It's like Salesforce or Infusionsoft. It's just a, w a place where if you don't have one of a software like this, um, it's a, a system where you can track appointments, you can um, enter information in about that lead or that uh, particular client. It has a calendar, it sends out automated emails, um, things that Touchstone doesn't do. But inside of Touchstone is the how-tos of all your other software, so how to use the CRM, how to use your client relationship software, any other software you have. So here in Touchstone, um, there'll be a step-by-step a -step or a link to tutorials on how your other software is used. So in this example, this is saying enter flags and actions into the CRM. Well, there may be, you know, 10 other processes where someone needs to enter flags and actions and notes into the CRM. It's not just in this one customer complaint process. There may be 10 or 15 other processes where the CRM needs to be used. So rather than entering the instructions of how to enter flags and actions into the CRM inside of this work plan, we have a process called CRM how-tos, and then we make hyperlinks to it. So if I click this, it says enter flags, it's taking me to a whole other process in Touchstone. So this process is in running the business, um, information technology, CRM how-tos. And then inside of this process, we have a lot of work plans, which breaks out the basic actions that someone would perform. In this example, I have another hyperlink right here, which goes to a tutorial that the CRM, the um, uh, makers of this software, this is Infusionsoft, have already created. So that took me to a link that this software that I'm using, the manufacturers of the software have already created. So if your other software programs have good tutorials in them, you can create links like this. And what this does for an employee is when they're learning something or they're following steps, they don't have to hunt through the tutorial of your CRM um, to find how to do things that they forgot how to do. You're, you're making these little fancy links right to it. Now, you don't need to do this for every action inside of that, that software, but the, the, the basic functions that are used all the time, it's really useful to have things like this. If your software that you're using does not have good tutorials, or you've customized it to the point that the tutorials they do have don't really make sense for how you do it, then you'll have to build a work plan here with a step-by-step -step for how to enter in the CRM plug. So everywhere that these actions are taken, where people are entering leads, they're running reports, they're entering flags, they're entering actions, just make hyperlinks to this one process called CRM how-tos. And then that, um, then people can just click. Another thing it does is it helps eliminate against redundancy. So if I had entered how to create flags in the CRM inside of every work plan where someone has to do that, then if I go to, if this ever changes, if I want to update how to enter the flags, then I have to find every work plan that I've put those tasks in and update it in 10 places. 
first of all, you'll you'll never remember every work plan that had that in it. And secondly, it's just redundant. So these hyperlinks really can help um, uh, eliminate against redundancy and make things easier to update. Uh, another technique in building work plans, try to um, consider a normal writing protocol, I call it. So normal writing protocol is how people generally write things. If they're not thinking about it, how they would write it out. So some basics about that, usually in titles, every word of the title, every first word of the title is capitalized. So customer complaint processing. Every word has a capital letter in the front of it. It's not all caps. It's not all lowercase. This is generally how people title things. Why that's important is it's consistency. So if I'm in putting in a title, I'll do it this way. If someone else comes in and they're an all cap kind of person, which isn't generally normal, they're gonna put things as all caps and then suddenly everything looks different based on who's doing it. So first letter of every word generally capitalized in a title. That goes for process titles as well as process tool titles. Generally, a title of something is short. It's not a sentence or a phrase. It's customer complaint processing. It's not how to handle customer complaints effectively. It's not that. It's a title. The further explanation of what this is about is here in this objective field. It's not the title. Um, another thing, try to stay away from bolding things or making things colored or capitalizing words inside of tasks. So for this, this example, if this is not a warranty issue, so whoever wrote this is trying to make that stand out. Well, not everybody does that. So if you are the kind of person who likes to bold things and make things red and do like capital one word all capitalized to make it stand out. Either decide that everybody's going to do that or decide that nobody's going to do that. Because the difference is if I'm writing this work plan and I like to do fancy bolds like this or I like to capitalize one word to make it stand out, then that's how my documentation is going to look. But if another person goes and documents a work plan and doesn't do that, then that's theirs not going to theirs is not going to look like that. And again, it's a consistency issue. So my recommendation would be use just standard writing practices. Don't bold things. Don't put colors. Don't capitalize things. Um, what one person wants to emphasize by doing that, another person wouldn't emphasize. They would just write it. Um, so you, you're getting into personal preferences as opposed to what most people do. Um, all right, so think clear, concise tasks, make lists instead of paragraphs, um, try to use consistent language, try to use um, consistent uh, writing practices. In the end, your work plan should be comprehensive enough that it's easy for someone who doesn't know how to do this to go in and um, read this and know what to do. That's when you know you're successful in documenting a work plan. So I'm going to go over, so someone's asking, they asked this a while ago about the using of the checklist and the forms. So I'm going to go and show you that over here on the dashboard before we run out of time. So where we were is where the process is documented. Right here is where it's used. So if I click the man, this control panel that I have and I go here to customer complaints, here's where I see the documentation. I can't edit or change anything here. This is just where somebody goes to view it, to be trained on it, to use it. So if there's a checklist in a process, I can click this checklist. And then I can go and actually tick these boxes off as I do this. I can save this as the name of the employee. 
or the customer probably would be make more sense. And then I can put in notes if I want to here. And then when I save it, it's date and time stamping it, and it's saving it back to Touchstone. So here's where I can't, I'm clicking around here. I can't change any of this checklist here. This has been done over where we were before on the process tools page. Here's just where I complete it. So if we go back here, I'll show you the custom form. You scroll down here. Here's the, those two custom forms. Here's that employee test, and here's the actual customer complaint form. If I click this here, then it's going to open and give me a copy of this form. So if I was filling out doing this test, I would go and answer this question, and then I'd go and choose these things, examples of what not to do, don't give excuses, give a discount, apologize, so I'm ticking those off. So here I'm just completing the form, and then again when I save it, it's going to date and timestamp it and save this back to Touchstone. Now my manager could go and run a report of me for that day and see this checklist saved here, or, I'm, or the test that I've taken. So here on the dashboard is where things are used, things like custom forms and checklists, that's where they're filled out and used. Any other questions about any of that? Nope. So what we went over today is how how to document a process. So here in the four key functions, I think one thing to remember is to go into your processes, if you've got them listed, go to the, and start on a work plan. Start to document and fill out the work plan. As you go through the work plan, it's going to become obvious if you need any of these other tools. So let the work plan guide you. Decide if you want other tools want to use other tools, don't force the use of the other tools. If all the process needs is a work plan, then let it just be a work plan. If you do need other tools, put the titles in for those and then make hyperlinks where they're used. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. If I didn't answer your question thoroughly enough or you didn't weren't able to ask a question, you can email me directly. I think most of you have my email because I send you reminders for these webinars. If not, go here to the Resource Center, and then right here under Support Plus, you can go to Contact Support um, and type in your question. Um, I'm the dedicated support person for the PILMA members. It doesn't mean I'll always be the one answering your question, but most of the time I will be. So if you type in a question right here, then it's likely I'll get back to you and answer it for you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye-bye.